Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I am Cameron Bertuzzi, and today we're talking about a very strong argument for Catholicism, and I've got my friend Swan Sona back with us. Uh, this is a, sort of a part two. We had a part one dialogue where uh, he was trying to convert me in the first one. He was very unsuccessful, so I was like, hey, you know what? Why don't you come back and, uh, and give it another shot? No, what actually happened was <laughs> at the end of the stream, my power went out in my house. Like that, that day, for some reason, in my neighborhood, all the power was like, going in and out of the neighborhood. And then later on the day, that day, my internet went out and it was just, it was horrible on the one day that I was streaming that week. Uh, so anyways, we decided, cause we had a lot left to talk about. We were like, let's just do kind of a part two follow up to our dialogue. And in this one, we'll, what we'll be able to do is focus a lot more of our time, really all of our time on this argument that you had prepared to, to give in the, in part one, it's a, it's, it, did you say it was like 12 different lines of reasoning or some, something yeah, along those lines? I added it's one more, so it's now 13 lines. So uh, there you we'll go. see. Yeah. 13 lines of reasoning. And this is a, you know, you, you might want to call it a cumulative case type argument for the truth of Catholicism. Would you agree with that? I mean, I haven't seen it, but. Yeah. Or at minimum, um, I would count it as a disproof of the Protestant ecclesiology. Okay. Okay. Uh, was is there anything that you would like to say by way of like caveat or before we before we jump in? Yeah. Well, like uh, if if you don't mind, I just want to explain too that I I've been battling a, a minor cold, and so if I sound nasally or more annoying than usual, that's why. And so uh, I appreciate you, Cameron, just inviting me back on, and uh, I hope that my voice won't be too much to deal with. Uh, and I think I'll be able to keep up. So, you know, I don't think this is impairing any cognitive functions of mine. So uh, here's what I'm thinking, Cameron. Uh, let me summarize what we talked about last time for okay. anybody who didn't view part one. And then I do want to talk about two more points on classical theism. And then we can get right into um, the argument that I have for uh, for the Catholic magisterium. OK, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I think like the most important thing we talked about last time was just how conversion is not a purely intellectual process. And I think a lot of people, at least when I looked at the comment section, they wanted to see me like dunk on Cameron Bertuzzi and Protestantism. But that's not really what I was going in for, you know. And even in the comment that I posted, I said that I care more about Cameron than winning an argument. And so, you know, when you're talking to somebody, sometimes, you know, you might have a successful argument or sometimes you might be just explaining what convinced you. And I know that, for instance, uh, Ezekiel chapter three, verse one to three wasn't convincing for a lot of people. But I think the point of why I mentioned that particular verse was just to show that um, the Old Testament already anticipates imagery of us eating, so to speak, weird things uh, as part of the divine plan. And so how that translates into the New Testament then is another discussion. So, yeah, I admitted that that was kind of a dud and I'm not afraid to admit that because I'm not here to win an argument. I'm here to grow and learn with Cameron as well. Uh, the other thing is that we talked about the transcendentals and how they play a part in conversion. So we need truth, but we also need beauty and we need goodness. And I think Cameron, you emphasized last time that truth was the most important thing, or at least it was the one thing that was holding you back from Catholicism. And so we got a little bit into, you know, Bayesian probability talk. And uh, I think the what we emphasized a lot was intellectual virtue. And I want to stress that like so much because I think so many people, you know, they just want to see an argument that just knocks down everything else or they just want to see someone get refuted and owned. But really, like in order to be able like when you're judging another person's belief system, you need to have the intellectual virtues to be able to kind of see the world from their angle and see where your position might falter. And so we talked about, for instance, um, having a consistent standard. So if you judge someone by a standard, then your viewpoint has to also survive the same standard. Uh, we talked about a uh, Sagan saw, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, we talked about all sorts of other um, uh, things to keep in mind. So, for instance, you know, Protestants can't just presuppose in the investigation that Protestantism is the default or the norm. Right. Uh, and, and, and things like that. And so I think that those were all important things to mention. We got a little bit into the doctrine of uh, analogy. And so let me just kind of begin there and then go on to my next two thoughts. Um, so when we discuss the doctrine of analogy, what I tried to argue is that at least all of us as Christians, if we accept the orthodox conception of the Trinity, we have to accept something like a doctrine of analogy. And so I'd say that the doctrine of analogy 
pertains to our language when we speak about God, right? And so there are certain times in which we can't speak of God in a direct one-to-one -one comparison with reality, or at least our create our created order. So, for instance, like um, you know, we can give the description of God in his in, in the Trinity as you know three divine persons who are each fully divine without division in you know the one reality of God, you know, the monotheistic reality of God. And so, you know, you can talk about God in that way, but then if when you ask the question, how do you have three persons in one God and you don't have a tritheistic system? The how question I think is when you have to start using something like a doctrine of analogy, where you say like, look, okay, I'm gonna use something in creation to kind of illustrate the point, but it's not a perfect comparison to the uniqueness of the Trinity. Uh, and so that's something that I wanted to emphasize. And uh, Cameron, I remember last time you you kind of said that uh, you didn't understand the doctrine of analogy or you didn't see like what was really going on. Um, but do, do you at least agree that there isn't a perfect one to one comparison um, to how the Trinity works in God in creation? I honestly, Swan, I don't even know what your question means. So when I think about a how question in the way that you're using it, I it, like, I, I want to think in terms of like, is there some kind of explanation? I, I don't even know really what question you're asking. Like what kind of truth are you wanting to get at? Is there some kind of, I, I, I honestly don't even know. Like what is your well, yeah, how question? So, Cause I, I don't so, see it as like some kind of like, you know, a how question in like the, the realm of biology would be like, you know, how did we get here? You know? And mm -hmm. so you might give some kind of like, you know, evolutionary account of, of what happened and reference fossils and all sorts of things. So that, that might be the answer to the how question there. But when it comes to the Trinity, I don't know that you want to give something along those lines, but if you did, you might still mm -hmm. want to explain it in terms of some more fundamental property that God has like his perfection. So I, yeah, sure. I honestly don't even know. Yeah. I, I would just have to get more clarity on like what exactly yeah, so for instance, you're trying to like get in our conversations with Muslims, right? The Muslim will ask the question, how can you believe in one and only one God, but nonetheless, uh, you know, say that there are three persons within that divine reality. And so when you ask the question, how, I think it's asking, like, how do you make sense of these two propositions being true? That you have one and only one God, and this one God um, is also three persons. How do you yeah. avoid tritheism? So you'd want to basically just find a way to make those two propositions consistent. Right. And so... You know, people at this point then will use kind of analogies to show how you can have, let's say, um, for instance, you could have three things, you know, uh, subsist in one substance or something like that. So people will people will use analogies of like, you know, states of being or even though if you take these analogies too far, then they do lead you into heresy uh, and they don't lead you to the orthodox conception of the Trinity. But my point here is that. Um, if you try to make sense of these two propositions and you use, let's say, illustrations or you talk about them and try to show why at least the conflict is superficial, you're going to have to use an analogy or something that is like or similar in creation. But what we're saying is that there's nothing exactly in creation like the Trinity itself. OK, yeah. So I disagree with that. I think that there's in response to that question, when you put it in terms mm -hmm. of like, you know, how do you resolve this apparent conflict? I think there's kind of two ways you could go about it and your way to go about it is to to give some kind of like informal response in the way of an analogies to be like here's an analogy that might help you understand how it's possible that yeah. these two things are consistent so that that'd be like an informal kind of response but a formal response to me would be like well let's just look at these propositions they're definitely not explicitly contradictory one god and three persons or three mm -hmm. beings so it's not it's not that they're explicitly contradictory in order in order to get an explicit contradiction you've got to have a and not a but that's a and b that's not a and not a right so mm -hmm. a formal a, a formal type of response would just be to show that like look there's actually no formal contradiction here so what the other person needs to do is actually to show that there is a contradiction show how one of the product one of the propositions uh, in conjunction with some other necessary proposition is going to entail the uh, the negation of the original proposition so like a yeah. mm. or uh, b has got to entail not a in order for it to contradict a so that to me is the way that we would resolve or answer that question formally would be to do it in kind of a, a logical oh so you would switch form. kind of the burden of proof right no i wouldn't switch the burden of proof i'd keep it where it needs to be i'd keep it exactly on them because they're right. the ones saying you know they're how how is this possible that's that's the question and so if they want to make some kind of argument 
they need to put that in terms of like there's there's an apparent contradiction but just because something is apparently contradictory doesn't mean that it's actually contradictory so if they want to make the argument that there's a contradiction here in the in the trinity then they've got to do some extra work in order to to show that so that's that's the way that i would say that you could answer that question without having to go the analogy route which is i, I think like i said more of an informal way of of doing it which is really helpful and i think that that's probably where a lot of us would want to go if we're just having like a you know everyday conversation with uh with a muslim or or anyone else who has a question about the trinities we'd probably want to go the analogy route but i yeah if i was to do you know if i was doing like serious philosophy and trying to think things through as clearly and as deeply as possible i'd probably go the more formal route and just be like look there's no just like with the problem of evil kind of what alvin planning did with the problem of evil where he's like god exists evil exists these two things are contradictory and then planning is like no they're not they're not explicitly contradictory at all and so you what you've got to do is you've got to add in some necessary proposition to these two other propositions god exists and god uh, and, and evil exists you've got to add some third proposition in order to derive a, a contradiction between those two which you can't do or it's not it's it's very difficult to do so i think that i would basically go kind of the same route that planning it did and he didn't what uh, his route didn't involve any analogies or anything so yeah I, I i still don't see the need for going the analogy route yeah i mean so i think the need to go to the analogy route so like if you're talking about like an argument i think what the strategy that you just laid out is is really effective right but when we think about how there is three persons in one god and someone wants to explain the ins and outs right i think usually like when we try to explain how in our created order we refer to parts and functions right and so necessarily when we talk about how things function or how things relate to themselves you know in creation we have to kind of break things into parts and so that doesn't work with the trinity right because the trinity can't there can't be division within the godhead and so what i'm saying is that on one hand i think the strategy that you laid out is effective but when we try to get into the divine reality itself um i mean i just don't see how you can easily avoid uh, or rather, I don't see how you can say that you have to say that there's nothing in creation that is exactly like the Trinity in terms of um, how you have three persons within one divine reality. That's the that's the point that I'm making. Um, and I, I, I don't think you would necessarily agree with that. Right. What we're just saying is that the Trinity is so unique that it is not repeated in any form or way within creation. There's nothing that is exactly like the Trinity in creation. So what is your question? So my point is just to show that I think that you do have to at least use some kind of doctrine of analogy. But my point is that first, let's establish that there's a there's something so unique about God that there's nothing like it in creation. And that's where that's how you get the doctrine of analogy kicking off in the first place, because you say that there's something so unique within God that whenever you try to use anything in creation to compare or explain it, you know necessarily that it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah, but then, so what? How, how does the argument flow from there? So like, yeah, there's nothing in creation that's exactly like God. Yeah. yeah Otherwise, it would it would be God, right? Because right, right. I mean, you can't have identity without. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then, the point is, so how does the argument? Yeah, I still, I'm still having trouble seeing so how the, the argument flows here. Right. So the point of the classical theist is just to show that everybody has to use, at least use some kind of doctrine of analogy or the recognition that one, um, that God is unique and transcendent above anything else in creation to the point that if we try to speak of God, like at least let's say, you know, you might believe that God is good in the same way that you and I are good to some extent. Right. Maybe we but he's like the exemplar of goodness or something like that. Um, my point here is just to show that. I think that we shouldn't think of the doctrine of analogy as something totally weird or strange because one, it's built on this idea of the total transcendence and uniqueness of God. And then secondarily, um, there are times when, when we try to speak of God, we have to use things in creation or at least, you know, the logic that we have in our experience of creation. And th those things in creation don't perfectly map onto God himself. So there's a, there's basically a uniqueness to God, uh, that's the point that I'm making. But uh, would you so say I'll that the second point is? Would you say that the second point is kind of that language is kind of imprecise or it's not exact? Yeah, language is impre in imprecise because when we like uh, try to understand something, like as I mentioned before, how you try to understand how uh, God can be three persons in one divine reality. Typically, when we ask how questions, we 
are asking about function or we're asking about parts or we're trying to break down things from top down uh, or rather from bottom up explanations. And so my point is that um, language in that sense and how we understand things doesn't necessarily map on well to at least something like the Trinity. But uh, yeah, Cameron, so I also, I think I want to sketch out maybe 30 minutes just for like this opening stuff and then an hour for the magisterium conversation. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if this was a dud too, then so be it, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, Cameron, do, do you at least kind of see what I'm saying here? Like, the well, doctor I, analogy, I understand. yeah. Now I understand your two, your two arguments or your two points that you think uh, lead us to the conclusion that we've got to use some kind of doctrine of analogy, but I, I still don't see how we're, how we're getting there from these two points. So right. and what so I like to do- like the wholesale, It's not like the whole doctrine of analogy, because then you need a bunch of background metaphysics to deal with everything else. I'm just saying in this particular case with the Trinity, um, I think we can agree that we need something like a doctrine of analogy. Okay. Uh, yeah. So originally we were talking about what, 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 what were we talking about with the doctrine of analogy? The, the answer to the how question, right? And right. so then mm -hmm. we, we talked about that a little bit, but then see, that's, that's a lot different from these two other points that you just brought up. God is unique. And then language is imprecise. So, well, in the case of the Trinity, those, I think those two things are true. Um, and my point, my, so Cameron, like what I'm not trying to do is I'm not trying to get you totally on board with the doctrine of analogy in all cases, right? Yeah. I'm just trying to show that it's not- You're trying to weird. open the door. Yeah, I'm trying to open the door, so to speak, right? Um, but I think you might be interested in my next point. So this is the other thing I wanted to mention about classical theism. Are you, let me you, say this real, real quick before yeah. we, yeah, yeah, let me just say this real quick. I mean, we could, we could talk more about these two points that you just brought up because I, I'm still not seeing the connection there between- that and the, the point that you want to make opening the door to the doctrine of analogy. But I want to address something that was kind of said in the comments of the previous video, like Cameron's not able to follow along. What's happening is that my, my brain, I like, if, if someone makes an argument or, or makes a claim about like the doctrine of now, all Christians have to accept the doctrine of analogy. That's like the conclusion of an argument. And so what I've been looking for with Swan is like, what are the, what are the, the different premises in an argument that could lead to that conclusion? What I'm trying to do and this is just how my brain like works is I'm trying to figure out what the propositions are because th only then can I see if when you add those together that they equal the conclusion, which I, I can't see that they do that at this point. So I'm, it's really just like, I'm trying to get more information. It's not that I'm, I'm not trying to like respond to him. I'm not trying to be uh, pedantic. I'm not trying to, to, to be an idiot. I'm just trying to really understand how the argument works because I don't see how the the logic of it actually flows and, and makes sense. So I, I, I tend to think of things in terms of like logic and rules of inference and how, you know, if P then Q P therefore Q stuff like that. I try to keep it all precise and I'm, I'm, my brain is very formulaic. I was good at math when I was taking math. And so I try to like put things in formulas that make sense and flow and everything. So I just wanted to, to give that little caveat that I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to really understand how the argument works before I can sign off on yeah. it or. And how about, let me ask you, Cameron, um, what do you think the doctrine of analogy is? The doctrine of analogy, my understanding of it, and we we kind of talked about this last time, right? Is yeah. is that we, yeah, our language is just kind of imprecise. And so when we're talking about God, we can only get kind of close to like a approximate ex estimation of like what it is that we're actually talking about. So yeah. mm -hmm. that's, I, I think that's roughly Right. We, we can yeah, only, because, like, language for, is almost analogous. It's not direct. It's not exact. It's only, it's always going to be imprecise, just like analogies are always imprecise. Yeah. I mean, so for instance, and, and so just, I'm trying to make my point as clear as possible. Right. And, uh, and I, I hope I'm doing an okay job at least, but um, yeah, I mean, so the point that I'm trying to make is that I'm trying to, I'm trying to help guide you and see if you can uh, to help guide you see the what the doctrine of analogy means right and so i'm trying to use at least one test case to illustrate what's going yeah. on here right and so like for instance yeah i mean I, I, some background yeah. like i've always had issues with the doctrine of analogy because mm -hmm. i'm very analytical it strikes me as, as almost like a continental kind of thing to me and yeah maybe mm -hmm. i'm just wrong about that you know maybe, maybe it's just that i don't see things or i'm, I'm missing something but it's, it yeah. strikes me as a very like non-analytic <laughs> way of talking because i mean you could say that language is imprecise and you know we can only get close we can only prox uh, approximate these properties and they don't map on to, to god exactly but i think that those 
when you make those types of claims, they run into very quick errors or uh, quick problems. So like, well, if our language is imprecise, then when you say that term, language is imprecise or that claim, then that you're using language to express that. And so there's like a regress problem that you immediately run up into when you when you make a claim like that. But then also it's like when you say that language is imprecise or you say that, um, you know, we can only use analogy analogies to describe God. Well, is that because that's a, that's a claim about God. And so it, it's it's going to be kind of the same thing here. Another regress problem. So that's the immediate yeah. thing that, that jumps to me is that when I think about the doctrine of analogies, this regress problem is that like, if you want to say that everything is imprecise and we can only get close, mm -hmm. then all of that stuff is going to apply to itself because it also applies to God. So yeah. it's just, it seems very problematic to me and I can't really understand and what I the think doctrine too, of like, is. Um, a lot of Thomists today want to avoid extreme apophaticism, you know, so where there's, there's this total denial that any of our language can actually very neatly map onto God. So, for instance, like when we when we say like God is good, right? Um, what we're not saying is, for instance, God is um, God is good in the sense that every action that he does is good, right? Like so, he he kind of has a good track record, so to speak, and that's what we mean by saying that God is good. What a classical theist means to say is that God is goodness itself; that his nature is goodness. And so, if you think about, for instance, how Dr. Craig gets out of the Euthyphro dilemma, um, you know, so. The euthyphro dilemma being do the gods love something because it's good or is it good because the gods love it right and so you know if you take one horn of the dilemma you might have an arbitrary morality you take the other horn of the dilemma and it seems as if the gods or the or god is subservient to a higher standard right and the point that dr craig makes is that no god is goodness itself god's nature and goodness are one in the same and so the point there is that um god is good in a way that you and i are not Right. So you and I, you like if I say Cameron's a good person, I'm saying that, yeah, Cameron has a really good track record or maybe he has really good dispositions. Right. And the same can be true of God. You can say that he has good dispositions. You can say that he performs good actions. But then when we specifically apply this to getting out of the Euthyphro dilemma, um, we're saying that God's nature and goodness go together in a way that is unique and perfect. Right. And that's how we. That's how you, one gets out of the Euthyphro dilemma. You make goodness and God identical to each other, um, such that there is no arbitrariness or a higher standard above God. What was your What was your point with that? Oh, so my point with that too is just to say that um, there are other ways in which, when we say, like for instance, God is good, like the Thomist is totally fine saying that, and we reject extreme apophaticism, right? Okay. Where you can't really say anything univocal about God, right? But the point here is that even when we say that God is good, I mean, there are ways in which we can compare human goodness to divine goodness, right? So, you know, if you're a good person, you tend, you do good things, right? And so I can look at the actions of God and say, yes, and God does good things. But then when we get deeper into God's relationship with goodness itself, we recognize that he has a unique relationship that you and I don't have, which is that God is identical to goodness itself. Whereas you and I kind of participate in goodness, you and I do good actions. You and I have good dispositions, but we aren't goodness itself, unlike God. And so, so you don't, yeah, show, you don't want to commit yourself to uh, apophaticism, like extreme apophaticism. No, um, but there, it, it is helpful sometimes to just explain how God is different or unique and not like some other things or not identical to something else. So you know, as I explained before. God, you can say God is good in the sense that he performs good actions, in the sense that he has good dispositions and virtues. But then there's a unique sense in which he's good that no other creature shares, which is that he is identical to goodness itself. He is the standard. He's not subservient to a higher standard, and he's not arbitrarily, um, you know, making goodness. You know, he can't decree tomorrow that rape is good because it's, it's evil in its own nature precisely because it contradicts who he is. So what I would say then in response to the doctrine of analogy point is that to me, like the, the, the exercise that you just performed with this euthyphro dilemma and explaining what we mean by God is good and just basically identifying it with God's nature, that is basically what I would want to do with, uh, with any of these terms. So any of the, the divine properties, omniscience, yeah. omnipotence, mm -hmm. I would want to do the same thing, uh, even the Trinity. So I, I don't think that I would want to go down the route of any kind of doctrine of analogy with those yeah, in, in I, those respects i think the point i'm trying to make cameron is that um the classical theism and thomism that 
you might be rejecting might actually not be as crazy as you think it is, at least at first glance. And I think that um, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes when I when I hear people like Dr. Craig and other uh, and other people explain the classical theist tradition, it kind of surprises me because I'm like, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of a, a simplified, crazy sounding version of what we believe. Right. But that's not totally like what's going on. I think there's a there's something more intuitive with what's going on in classical theism. And that's what I, that's what I'm trying to show. And actually, um, if I can get to my second point, Cameron, I'll show you <clears> actually <throat> a really nice avenue to demonstrate this. Um, yeah. Before you get to that, let me just sure. uh, say this. So when I, I talked with uh, Christopher Tomaszewski, is that how you say Tomaszewski, his, his yeah, name? yeah, yeah, yeah. Tomaszewski. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I'm even making this connection here is because when you're thinking about divine simplicity, uh, the typical move here is to make the is to make the appeal to the doctrine of analogy because you want to say that all of these properties are identical to each other. God's omnipotence is identical to his omniscience, is identical to any property you want to say God has. So it is going to be relevant in the case of these properties. So you might want to say that we're not complete, you know, we're not going to say that language is, is imprecise in every single case, but sure, you're going yeah. to say it at, at the most fundamental level, which is the level that we were talking about here and even the example that you gave. So I still th like I, I still think it's relevant. And I, I get the point that you want to make about this, so, you know, some some Protestants or uh, they, they kind of shoot down these these really extreme versions of classical theism. Uh, but I don't think that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm thinking about in terms of what other Catholics, uh, very smart Catholics like Christopher, mm -hmm. he's been on my show a couple of times. Uh, people like him have uh, appealed to the doctrine of analogy in very specific cases, especially relevant to what we were talking about last time with the, the some of the objections I raised to divine simplicity and stuff. So, um, I yeah, I get I get your point, but I think that it's still going to uh, to be relevant here. Is that I I still don't see the need to appeal to a doctrine of analogy. Um, you know, you, you may want to limit that to uh, just a few cases. The doctrine of analogy sure. doesn't apply across the board, but it applies to a few cases. Um, but I still don't see the need to apply it in the case of uh, the divine properties, which is the case that, uh, which is the way in which Christopher used it. And I, I assume that you would probably want to use it too, the doctrine of analogy to explain divine simplicity. So I still don't see the need because that, that was going back to your original point was you wanted to open the door to the doctrine of analogy. Um, and I still don't see the need to open the door to the doctrine of analogy. Yeah. I mean, and I just, my, I guess my response would be that, um, my inclination or my intuition is that, you, you know, you're going to have to appeal to the doctrine of analogy, at least with some things about God, because if you accept the proposition that God is like totally unique and transcendent over creation, right? And then you accept this other idea that there's nothing in the created order like God, like exactly like God, at least in some respects or some capacities, right? Then how you go about explaining the divine reality is going to require you to kind of take some liberties with language or stretch certain ideas and terms right so for instance like when i talk about each of the divine persons typically speaking like when we talk about eachness or we use that word each it typically implies a division of some sort right but when we talk about the doctrine of the trinity that's not what we're trying to do but let me get to the second point cameron and then uh yeah let's can, move we on move we've on. been talking about yeah. the doctrine of analogy for half an sure. hour already <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to point out is that one of your favorite arguments for the existence of God is the contingency argument. And um, the contingency argument, I read like I was listening to, you know, I in the past, I'd listened, You've listened to You've interviewed me, interviewed me on it. Yeah, I remember on your channel while my room was like super messy and like back <laughs> when I had less uh, nice equipment. Um, but so with the contingency argument, I was listening to Josh Rasmussen, you know, discuss it the other day mm -hmm. and he began using terms that reminded me a lot of just Aristotelian terminology. So I think he used, he sometimes uses actual and potential. Even mm -hmm. Dr. Craig sometimes uses this when defending the Kalam, right? And so it made me realize that the contingency argument is actually very similar to one of St. Thomas Aquinas's arguments for the existence of God. And other people, I think like Stephen Nemesh and uh, Christopher Tomaszewski have brought up this argument and I kind of want to use the contingency argument as a way to illustrate the deente argument or proof for God's existence, right? Uh, so as you know, with the so contingency argument... So you want to do that before we get to the to the presentation? Yeah, I'll try my best uh, okay. just to explain I, it, and then we'll see how it goes, yeah. Um, so uh, the contingency argument, of course, it's this idea, right, that there are things that, are, that don't have necessary existence. Um, they don't have to exist by necessity, right? 
And so uh, eventually to explain the set of all contingent things, you either have a contingent explanation or a non-contingent explanation, but it can't be a contingent explanation. So it has to be a non-contingent explanation. If it's non-contingent, then it's necessary, right? And so you need to have a necessary explanation for the set of all contingent things. When it comes to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's version, which I'd call the, De which is the Deante argument, Aquinas, you know, he says like, yeah, it's, it's good that we talk about things in terms of them being contingent, right? But when we say that something is contingent, you know, Aquinas would want to talk about the composition of that thing or what makes it the case that it's contingent. And so Aquinas would talk about how there's a real distinction between a thing's essence and its existence, right? And so by that, I simply mean that, for instance, um, think about uh, the pro you know, think about our human nature, right? Our, our, our status as rational animals. Um, we're contingent, right? So you and I don't have to exist. We could go out of existence. Um, and also, it's not the case that in every possible world, right, you know, rational animals like human beings, homo sapiens sapiens had to exist. And so the point here is that Aquinas would say that this means then that our existence is not entailed by our essence. That is to say that um, by nature, it's not the case that we necessarily have existence. OK, and so there is a real distinction between our nature and the fact that we exist, so to speak. And then that's basically sim very similar to the idea of the contingency argument, right? It's just kind of couched in different terminology. So for instance, there's nothing about, let's say the, pro you know, leafness that demands that a leaf exists in every possible world, right? Uh, there's nothing about rational animality that demands that it exists in every possible world. And so it's just saying that things by nature don't have necessary existence. That's all that Aquinas is saying here. And so there's a real distinction where you could really imagine and have a coherent state of affairs where, you know, there are no human beings on planet Earth or where there is no planet Earth, right? Or where this leaf that's outside my window goes out of existence in five seconds, right? Or something like that. Um, and so Aquinas eventually says, okay, so if you have something, if you so take all the set of contingent things, right? And they don't have necessary existence. So by their nature, existence is not entailed or secured, so to speak then at that point, you need something that is non-contingent or that is necessary. Now, in this case, then, that means that you have to have something that has no real distinction between its essence and its existence. That is to say that its essence is existence itself or is to exist, right? And at that point, then, if, the na if, if that thing's nature and existence itself kind of overlap together, then its nature is simply existence itself. That's kind of the argument that Aquinas would use. And what I'm trying to show, and honestly, like if I'm not doing a perfect job explaining it, a really good person to have on your show is Gavin Kerr and uh, mm. Pat Flynn, because both of them specialize in explaining uh, divine simplicity and the Dante argument. But what I'm trying to show is that even the contingency argument, which you're a huge fan of, I think you could kind of at least appreciate that Aquinas, uh, or you could, you could appreciate the arguments of Aquinas because he's drawing from or, you know, rather, this could be a bridge to understanding Aquinas as well. You see what I'm kind of saying there? Um, Yeah, I'd have to get a lot more clarity on uh, what's meant by existence. Sure. Could you yeah. just define that for me? What, you're, what yeah, you mean so, by the term is used in the argument? Yeah, so the, the term existence, um, you know, it's referred to in Aquinas as essay. And so existence is not viewed as just a static state that you're either in or you're out of. It's this act of all acts. It's the fundamental act that makes something exist, that makes something be, so to speak. I mean, so uh, kind of contrary to one's analytic intuitions, it's not totally, I don't think it's totally reducible down to just a simple definition, but existence is simply the act of being, right? So it's the most fundamental act that all of us do. And we either fall out of this, we either lose this act of being or we um, we remain and we continue acting and being. So it's an action. So it's an act of being. Okay. Right. And then mm -hmm. the, but the argument is that, uh, so no essence, is it no essence entails existence or no essence is existence? Well, at least among contingent things, right? There, there's a real distinction between essence and existence. So basically to put that in simpler terms or the corollary, it would be, um, yeah, no essence entails existence. 
So for instance, there's in nothing just, about- In just contingent things? Right. And for instance, there's nothing about rational animality. I mean, it's almost very similar to the ontological argument too, but there's nothing about rational animality itself that demands that there be a rational animal in every possible world. Because, you know, you could conceive of rational animals just not con existing in a possible world or evolution happening differently if you subscribe to evolution. So it sounded like by essence, I was I was thinking of like, you know, a, a set of essential properties for some sure. some object, which yeah, and so, the example and you essence, just gave is not is not an essence. So like it, it kind of confused me. Essence and, in, in, you know, Aristotelian Thomas terminology is just the real definition of something. And so, for instance, if you talk about like essential properties, we would say that the essence is the explanation for why all those properties conglomerate into a particular thing. So, for instance, um, rational animality, right? Um, my ability to laugh, my property of risability, uh, my property of rational thought, my property of having certain animal functions and powers. This all flows, so to speak, from my animal, my rational animal essence or nature. So rational animality, you would say that that's a essence? Sorry, I'm getting confused here. Yeah, like essence or nature, right? It's the thing that explains why all the why all I have all the properties that I do. Okay. So it's not the case that like my properties are just randomly, you know, like, yeah. you know, put together on me, but it's that they're all united together with this very simple definition, rational animality. And it's the real definition, right? So the essence the is real the real definition. definition which is basically just the you but you wouldn't say the real definition is just the essential properties would you um it's just the set of essential properties which to me is just the essence yeah that's that's how i would define essence is just the set of essential properties yeah i mean so like but I, i'd want to go a little further and just say yeah so it, it, it part of it is the set of essential properties right but it's also the thing that unifies it all together and makes it one in the same particular object so, you know, the, so like, I think we're basically saying the same thing, but what I'm saying is, is that, um, the pro like the essential properties that something has, if you mm -hmm. want a sufficient reason or explanation for why all those properties conglomerate into one particular thing, then the essence, which is this general unifier, so to speak, of all the properties, putting them all together into one thing, that's what we would call the essence. Okay. So essence sounds like it's actually doing a, in some kind of explanatory work. Right. Yeah. I would say so. Um, yeah, it would, it, would, it would explain certain properties and facts about the creature itself. Uh, so it'd be a necessary, yeah. it'd have to be a necessary fact, I assume, because essential properties are necessary. So it'd be a necessary yeah. explanation of necessary properties. Yeah, it would be, yeah, it would be, so it would be an explanation once you, once the thing exists, but the essence itself doesn't guarantee existence. It's just saying once the thing exists, here's the explanation for what it is. So I so going back to the argument, the what is it called, the Dante argument? Dante, yeah. Dante. Um, mm -hmm. It's it sounds like one of the things that struck me right away was that uh, it sounds like he'd have some issues with uh, Anselm because Anselm, I believe, argued something along those lines. Is that from the nature of God we could derive that he, yeah. he exists? Yeah, and so like some Thomists, they like the ontological argument, some don't. Um, so people who defend the like, so there are some people who defend the Dante and they like the ontological argument. So we don't have to strictly be wedded to some of Aquinas's intuitions against Anselm. Okay. And then another question is, uh, so the, the language that you use, and it seems kind of essential to the argument is that there's a, a real distinction between essence and existence, the yeah. act of mm -hmm. being, which I don't, right. I still don't really know what act of being means. Um, even though it's yeah, like I mean, three words, you, you know, as opposed to one existence though, you know, like if you had to give a definition of existence, what would you define it as? Um, I, I like to think in terms of true propositions. I think that's like an easier way of doing it. So like when an essence is instantiated, there's a, yeah. or an, or an essence. Yeah, it would be, it, there would be certain true propositions. So I, I may just want to avoid that term altogether and just talk about what's, what's true propositions, possible worlds. I may want mm. to just punt to that in truth as opposed to talk about existence, but that, that may just be personal preference based on, you know, insufficient familiarity with, all the possible language that I could be using. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like, um, I, 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 I would agree to some extent, right? Because like, even when you had a uh, Stephen Nemesh on talking to Ben Watkins, they talked about how a contradiction is, uh, it would, it would, 
I, it was, it's something like if you have a contradiction, then also that precludes the existence of something, right? Because if you don't have, if you have a contradiction, something that cannot possibly be true, then you can't have something that exists, right? That is a contradiction. So it's like, you know, coherence is, let's say, just a fundamental condition for the possibility of existence mm -hmm. um, or something like that. So, yeah, sure. Um, well, what I wanted to see. get to, yeah. the, the mm -hmm. question that I had was, I'm thinking about all this in my mind. So bear with me if I'm fumbling around with it. There's a real distinction between essence and existence. And then yeah. the payoff, the argument is that there's no distinction between essence and existence when it comes to God. There's no distinction. Yeah. So when you get to so, something that's necessary um, and you cash out necessity or like that necessary being in terms of the fact that there is no real distinction. That is to say that there's no coherent way to possibly separate its nature from the act of existence or existence itself, then that's what you mean by a necessary being. Okay. So, but then the, in, in the first case, cause we'd have to leave room open for a being that is whose essence is existence, right? So you'd have to modify the language to, in the, the premises of the argument to be like uh, no contingent thing, no then, contingent yeah, and that's, essence. That's is, what I tried to stress when I explained the argument. So I'm sorry if I missed that. Yeah. Maybe I just am not remembering how it was all laid no, it's out. Good. Again, trying yeah, to do but, this all in my head. No, you're good. So like what I'd recommend at this point is, you know, I'd strongly recommend Gavin Kerr and Pat Flynn because, I mean, once again, I'm just stage setting here, but then yeah. I'm going to get into a direct argument after this. But I feel like this is a nice way to just show you how you could kick off the possible tra trek towards classical theism by using an argument that you love and that another thinker in the classical theist tradition has kind of added a bit more to. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd need to think more about it. And I, it probably sure. is not going to be helpful to the audience for me to try to tease it out slowly here on, uh, mm -hmm. on the, the live stream, which uh, it's, it, there was a philosopher that I interact with a lot. His name is Thomas Bogardus, who's Catholic, by the way. I think he was Methodist when he, when he grew up and now he's Catholic. Um, but he once said, and it's, it's stuck with me ever since he said, philosophy is best done slowly. And I try to do that. Yeah. Like I try to mm -hmm. think through things very slowly and that's probably frustrating for a lot of people not just Catholics watching, but uh, atheists who watch my channel as well when I do this kind of thing. So I just like to think things through as slowly as possible so I'm not missing stuff. And I think that's the best way to do it anyways. So, um, but yeah, let's get right. to your presentation. I mean, there's a whole lot more that could be said about all the stuff that we've talked about so far, but I, I feel like we probably need to go ahead and get into the presentation yeah. so we can start mm -hmm. discussing it. Might be a little bit easier. We'll have some stuff on the screen. So yeah, I've got okay. it up and just uh, let me know. Or you, you, you're you actually controlling it on your end, so... Uh, feel yeah. free. And I'll, what I'll do, Swan, is I think I'll, I may just pause when I've got a question along the way. How does that sound? Or would you prefer yeah, to just, just like go all the way through? Let me know. Okay. All right. Well, okay. So once again, let me thank Cameron for having me on. And so I'm going to now give a presentation uh, defending the existence of the magisterium within scripture itself. And uh, one thing I just want to mention up front is that I, like, you know, last time I talked about like silver bullet arguments, right? And so I, you know, I asked Cameron if he viewed the resurrection of Jesus as something similar to this. And so I think that's a good question to ask later. But, you know, for instance, um, when Mike Lacona talks about the resurrection of Jesus, he talks about how, you know, when he had doubts about the existence of God, Gary Habermas would still call him and ask him, hey, but if Jesus rose again from the dead, then no matter what doubts or hesitations or apparent inconsistencies there are, there must at bottom be some kind of sufficient explanation or harmonization. And so my point here is that the magisterium, if it's provided in scripture, then even if you diff, you know, you have disagreements with the magisterium now. So for instance, maybe you're a, an annihilationist. Uh, maybe you believe that the Bible doesn't support traditional marriage or something like that. Um, then if the magisterium has spoken, then by virtue of affirming that the magisterium is taught in scripture, that it is infallible, right? then you would have to assent if you're being consistent with what the definition is, what we're affirming in its precise content. So for instance, if someone believes that, you know, an argument for God is convincing and it, dem it you know, demonstratively shows that there is, you know, a, a God who is good, who has all the divine properties, but they have doubts about the problem of evil, then they have to, at least in consistency, they have to know that there is an explanation somehow of having a good and powerful God, despite the fact that there's evil in the world. And so I'm trying to show that if you can demonstrate this magisterium, then you have a similar kind of silver bullet argument. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show 13 parallels 
between the apostles and the rabbis. And what I'm going to try to show is that when you read the New Testament in its Judaic first century context, you cannot avoid the reality of what the church fathers, especially the apostolic fathers, talk about, which is this idea that Christ established this institution that could definitively teach on doctrine, on faith and morals, excommunicate heretics, issue anathemas, and that it could pass this power along fully um, to successors. And so this is precisely what I'm going to argue. Uh, and so first, I, the first parallel I want to talk about is that in the Old Testament, Moses establishes the courts of Israel. And so in Jewish, in the Jewish mindset, there's this idea that, you know, Moses is the founding father, so to speak, of the Jewish courts. Now, uh, in Exodus 18, 26 and Deuteronomy 17, 8 to 13, these courts are established and their fundamental role is to interpret the Torah and discipline the community in order to bind the people to the interpretation of the Torah provided by the courts. All right. And so, you know, we see the Sanhedrin being established in Numbers 11, 16 to 17. In Deuteronomy 17, 8 to 13, Moses is very explicit about the structure of the courts and the Jewish people believe that actually Deuteronomy 17 is when the Sanhedrin is established. Now, the thing that matters is that Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, to him you shall listen. So Jesus, uh, Moses is saying that the Messiah, basically, when he comes, this prophet, he's going to be like me. And that's how you're going to be able to know that he's been sent by God. And so the rabbis had the saying, as it was with the first redeemer, so it shall be with the last. And there was already this idea then that if the Messiah was truly the Messiah, then he would do things that Moses did. And so we have multiple examples in the New Testament of Jesus being this new Moses figure. And so what I'm saying here, here is that at least both the rabbis and the apostles found, based their authority upon Moses, or in the apostles' case, the new Moses. So in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, Peter identifies Christ as the new Moses. And then I explain in my paper in responding to Jerry Walls, uh, multiple, I think I provide uh, 10 parallels explaining where in the New Testament Jesus and Moses are given direct parallels and comparisons to each other. Although for the sake of time, I won't read it all, and I think it's pretty intuitive. The other thing, too, to mention is that a lot of people object to using typology. And so here I have a quote from the Protestant New Testament scholar Craig L. Blomberg in his book, A Handbook of New Testament Exegesis. And the point he makes here and in the bolded is that in the theistic worldview of the ancient Mediterranean world, the assumption was that God revealed himself in consistent, discernible ways. And so he goes on to say, for the Christian, it could not have been coincidence that just as the children of Israel had to come out of Egypt when God gave Moses the revelation on Mount Sinai, now again, Jesus, the inaugurator of the new covenant, had to return to Israel from Egypt before he began his ministry. And so the point I want to make here is that a lot of people complain, well, typology is just, just so tenuous and so thin. But the problem is that you're not exercising this kind of intellectual virtue of taking into consideration what would have counted as evidence to the original audience. The original audience of the New Testament were expecting that God would repeat certain things he had done in the Old Testament into the New Age in order so that they could see, okay, the God that is working in Jesus Christ is the God of our forefathers. And so this is actually going to be a very important point because the Jews had certain beliefs about what the Messiah would do. And at least one of them that I'm going to mention is based in scripture and it anticipates the resurrection or rather the redemption of the Sanhedrin. Okay, so now in the New Testament, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is Matthew 16, 19 and 18, 18. Both the apostles and the rabbis claim the power to bind and loose. So let me repeat that the power to bind and loose is a rabbinic power. We know what it means based on the context of the New Testament in the first century. So for instance, Flavius Josephus in his book, The Jewish War, he explains, quote, now Queen Alexandra hearkened to them to an extraordinary degree, that is to say the Pharisees, as being herself a woman of great piety towards God. But these Pharisees artfully insinuated themselves into her favor by little and little and became themselves the real administrators of public affairs. They banished and reduced whom they pleased, 
they bound and loosed at their pleasure. And so the point is that we know that the power to bind and loose was a pharisaical power, and it was a power to discipline the community, to banish or excommunicate. And I'll go into more detail. So for instance, Leander E. Keck in his book, uh, The New Interpreter's Bible Commentary on Matthew and Mark, he writes, quote, the language of binding and loosing is rabbinic terminology for authoritative teaching, for having the authority to interpret the Torah and apply it to particular cases, declaring what is permitted and what is not permitted. So once again, if we're gonna be charitable to the church fathers, ask yourself the question, where did they get this idea that they could interpret the Bible definitively and discipline the community? Once again, Craig S. Keener in his book, uh, The New Testament, uh, IVP Background Commentary in the New Testament, he writes, quote, binding and loosing could refer to detaining or releasing, releasing prisoners, hence could function figuratively in a judicial setting. Rabbis also use these terms regularly for legislative authority in interpreting scripture. Because binding and loosing also were figurative images for punishing and releasing, they could likely be used judicially as well. Uh, to quote from two other sources, um, and this is the a rabbinic commentary on the New Testament by Rabbi Samuel Tobias Locks. He's a rabbi who looked and read the Gospels from a Jewish, uh, the synoptics from a Jewish lens. He writes, quote, bind and loose mean to forbid and or permit some act which is determined by the application of the halakha. Now, in Judaism, there are two modes of interpretation. One is Agadah and the other is Halakha. So Halakha, as the New Encyclopedia of Judaism explains, encompasses practically all aspects of human behavior, birth and marriage, joy and grief, agriculture and commerce, ethics and theology or faith and morals. The point here is that Halakha was the interpretive mode of the rabbis when they were interpreting the scriptures to give a normative declaration about what must be believed. And hence, halakha, I think in Hebrew, literally means the way that one ought to act, the, uh, the, way, the path that one must follow. We also see in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, quote, by conferring the power to bind and loose upon church leadership, Jesus authorizes it to interpret the scriptures and establishes norm for Christian behavior, the Christian halakha. On the other hand, binding and loosing are often interpreted as the power to ban members from the community and to readmit them. Once again, uh, this is from uh, Michael J. Walken, uh, Wilkins in his commentary, Matthew NIV Application Commentary. He's a professor at the fac uh, faculty of the Talbot School of Theology. He writes, quote, in rabbinic terminology, binding and loosing describes the authority of the rabbis in teaching and, discipl and discipline to declare what is forbidden or permitted and thus to impose or remove an obligation by a doctrinal decision. So once again, these are Protestant New Testament scholars who are acknowledging that Christ gave the apostles this rabbinic power to bind and loose. And once again, I have Dale Allison and W.D. Davies who note that the dominant use of binding and loosing in the relevant rabbinic terminology is for teaching authority in interpreting the Torah. And so sometimes uh, I've heard the objection, well, Swan, I mean, binding and loosing just means excommunication. Well, in actuality, if you're doing the historical research, it was applied for excommunication on the basis of if you were to disagree with something that was orthodox or established as doctrine and necessary for belief to remain in the covenant and the community. And so Alfred Edersheim, in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he offers a very nice summarization. The words binding and loosing are the literal translation of the Hebrew equivalents asar, which means to bind in the sense of prohibiting, and hetir, which means to loose in the sense of permitting. These two powers, the legislative and judicial office, which belong to the rabbinic office, Christ now transferred, and that not in their pretension, but in their reality to his apostles. Once again, Christ is establishing a new rabbinic authority based upon the apostles. Now, someone might object, well, what was the function of binding and loosing? Well, both the rabbis and the apostles and their successors used binding and loosing to excommunicate heretics and issue anathemas. Okay, so let me quote you from the Jewish Encyclopedia. So the Jewish Encyclopedia says, quote, this does not mean that as the learned men, this is to say the Pharisees, they merely decided what, according to the law or the Torah, was forbidden or allowed but that they possess and exercise the power of tying or untying a thing or binding and loosing a thing 
by the spell of their divine authority. This was an authority given to them by God and backed by heaven. Just as they could, by the power vested in them, pronounce and revoke an anathema upon a person. The various schools had the power to bind and loose, to forbid and to permit. They could bind all sorts of things, like, you know, a fast day. Um, and let's see here. This power and authority vested in the rabbinical body of each age or in the Sanhedrin received its rat ratification and final uh, sanction from the celestial court of justice. That is to say, from heaven itself. Okay, so we also have another source here from, once again, from W.D. Davies and Dale Allison, where they explain that at least in uh, Babylonian Talmud, Moed Kat uh, 16a, Asar does mean to impose an excommunication. And so the point I'm making is that when you look at early Christian history and you see the successors of the apostles issuing anathemas or excommunicating heretics, where did they get this idea from to do that? They got it from the power to bind and loose. And we know from the first century context and the later rabbis, that's precisely what they use the power to bind and loose as. But more importantly, these powers are demonstrated in the scriptures themselves. So for instance, in Matthew 18, 17 to 18, here's what Jesus says. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, he is to be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I say to you, sorry, I need to get water. All right. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Christ is saying here that if he does not listen to the authority of the church, he has to be outcasted as someone who's not part of the community, who is a Gentile or a tax collector. This is excommunication being given to the Matthaean church. Likewise, the New Testament mentions rejection of heretics. So in Titus 3.10, Paul writes, reject a divisive person, heretikon, after a first and second warning. In Strong's Greek 141, it explains that heretikon means disposed to form sex, uh, sex, sectarian, heretical, factious, from the same as heretizo, a schismatic. But moreover, we know that Paul issues anathemas in the New Testament. So, for instance, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed in the Greek anathema. In Galatians 1, 8, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to what we have preached you, he is to be accursed anathema. Galatians 1, 9, he uses anathema once again. And as Strong's Greek 3, 3, 1 explains, you know, it's to issue a curse uh, to ban or excommunicate. So notice here that Paul is using his power as an apostle to issue anathemas. And interestingly enough, we know that Paul was once a Pharisee himself. And we know that the Pharisees used their binding and loosing power to excommunicate heretics and issue anathemas. Where did Paul get this idea that he could issue anathemas and call out heretics? The fourth parallel is that both the apostles and the rabbis claimed heaven-backed binding and loosing. So Ulrich Luz, in his commentary on Matthew 8 to 20, explains, quote, Then to bind and to loose correspond to put in fetters and to acquit. Furthermore, it is the rabbinic conviction that God or the heavenly court recognizes the halakhic decisions and the judgments of the rabbinical courts. Thus, not only the concepts binding and loosing, but the entire saying is rooted in Jewish thought. That saying is when Jesus says, Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. The reason why Jesus mentions heaven when he mentions binding and loosing is because the rabbis would also claim that when they bound and loose, they had the backing of heaven. Likewise, Craig S. Keener explains, many Jewish people felt that the Jewish high court acted on the authority of God's tribunal in heaven, in a sense, ratifying its decrees. And Keener also cites multiple examples within the rabbinic literature where God or heaven ratifies the decisions of the earthly Beth Din or the rabbinic court. And then just to give you one example, in the Babylonian Talmud, Makkah 11b, it says, quote, three rulings were made by the earthly court and the court on, on high concurred with what they had done. So notice the earthly binding and loosing is backed by heaven. This is why Jesus constructs the phrase in Matthew 16, 19, and 18, 18 in this fashion.
Now, how do we do we get infallibility from this? So I do want to put a caveat or a note here that I think I was too quick to ascribe infallibility to the Sanhedrin, because um, clearly Horiot implies that the Sanhedrin can err. But it's interesting that at least in the time of the New Testament and the rabbis, they talk about the divine inspiration of the Sanhedrin. So they talk about how the Sanhedrin was guided by God. God would confirm through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was a figure in Judaism before Christianity and around the time of Christianity uh, that would guide the rabbis to truth. But let me just kind of continue explaining my point. So Charles Talbert in his 2010 commentary on Matthew writes, quote, the translation will have been bound slash loose in heaven represents in Greek a paraphrastic future perfect passive. Traditionally, this has been interpreted to mean not that heaven ratifies Peter's judgment, but that Peter's judgment reflects what God has already determined. And he cites from uh, Robert Gundry and Chamberlain. Now, I looked at the Robert Gundry quote, and here's what Gundry writes. He says, quote, the illusion to scribal activity in the figure of keys leads us to think of the present form of the kingdom in the church. Uh, this agrees with the lo earthly locale of Peter's binding and loosing. And with the emphasis throughout Matthew on partial realization of the kingdom now, the passives will have been bound and will have been loosed imply divine action. So in my engagements with my friend Stephen Nemesh, he has made the argument that, well, this doesn't imply infallibility or it doesn't imply divine action on God's part because maybe Peter um, so happens to bind and loose this correctly and, and Jesus is, is kind of reassuring Peter. Okay, you will bind and loose correctly, but it's not because, you know, you're being divinely guided, but you're being faithful to my message. Here, Robert Gundry and Charles Talbert are saying, no, uh, this is implying that whenever Peter binds and looses, it will only be because God has, so to speak, divinely acted. So this is to say that Peter will only bind and loose what God has already bound and loosed in heaven. And even D.A. Carson in the Expositor's Bible Commentary on Matthew writes, quote, But if it is translated as the future perfect shall have been bound, the passage could be taken to support the notion that the disciple Peter must therefore enjoy infallible communication from God in every question of binding and loosing. But moreover, I want to emphasize a particular point in favor of this divine causality interpretation, where Peter only binds and looses whatever God binds and looses, including the rest of the apostles. So Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So in the Semitic phrase, flesh and blood, this is to say human power. So it is not Simon Barjona you know, deducing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It wasn't by Peter's deduction or inference from certain experiences. It was because it was divinely revealed. Um, some of the Protestants that I've engaged with who defend something like Stephen's interpretation have had to deny, at least if they're being consistent with their counterinterpretation, that Peter did not receive divine revelation here. But to me, that seems to simply militate against what the actual context is. And even, in fact, other New Testament scholars like Ajith Fernando, and uh, I'm trying to see here, I think that's Craig S. Keener's commentary on the bottom, uh, whoever that is, I have a, a little icon in my way of seeing the full description, um, or Eckhard J. something. Uh, all of them acknowledge that Peter had something like a gift of prophecy, where he received private help and guidance from God to know the truth. So for instance, in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, in the instance with Ananias and Sapphira, where they hoard their property from the Jerusalem church and are exposed, it, they, Ananias and Sapphira never tell Peter that they had hoarded their property from God, the property that was supposed to be given to the Jerusalem church. And yet, nonetheless, Peter was able to know what they had done. And so I've highlighted here the portions where it seems that Peter continues to have this gift of prophecy and private guidance. All right, parallel number five. Do, we, do you mind if I jump in here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, if we can, just kind of pause and, and summarize where we've come so far. Sure. So yeah. uh, it sound it, it seemed like. Let me put it put it back up. Original authority. Are you? This seems to be like we're moving on from binding and loosing. Is that right? Yeah, to some extent. So now what I'm going to show is that the power to bind and loose can be passed with full authority to the successors. Okay. And this is the proper Ju Jewish context in which you are to understand uh, the New Testament and what comes later in the church.
Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to cut you off like mid sure. mid thought or. And mid also I've been rambling order. on and so I feel kind of bad, but you know, this is my presentation. So yeah. No. And I'm, I'm kind of like, I mean, I would like to just process this a whole lot more before I was able to be even be close to be able to, to offer like critical thoughts of it. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll do what I can to just, you know, maybe, maybe what can be beneficial to the audience and myself is just to, to have you just clarify things and tell sure. me how the argument mm -hmm. works. Cause yeah, I mean, when you, when you mentioned, uh, Steven's view and interpretation, that was kind of my view is that like, this all seems, I mean, I, I didn't really see much to disagree with other than the question would then be like, what, how do you know, where do we go from here? Like, what does this actually imply? And it seems yeah. like the mm -hmm. Catholic position seems like it, it would go a little bit further then I mean, I, I think Protestants, yeah. even, I mean, there's a reason why the Protestants that you cited are still Protestants, even though they're, sure. you mm -hmm. know, you use their quotes. So, and I think that they'd probably just agree that, yeah, there was some kind of authority, the, the, the binding and loosing meant something real, but it just wasn't at the level that's necessary for sure. Catholicism to be true. So, um, but maybe, maybe that's where the, the rest of the, yeah. the presentation I, I, is going to go. I've done a lot of research to show also, um, given the original Jewish context of the New Testament, was the power to bind and loose transferred in full capacity to successors? And could it be transferred for an indefinite number of generations? And the answer is yes. And so that's the next part of my research. Because a lot of the Protestant scholars um, who I'm going to cite, they acknowledge that the apostles were given the power to bind and loose, were given rabbinic mm -hmm. authority. Um, some of them straight up say, yeah, Jesus established a new Sanhedrin. But a lot of them will deny the nature of the succession that occurs. And so I want to show based on the same historical methodology, you have to say, no, the power was transferred in full um, and defend what the early church fathers said, basically. The what was transferred in full? Sorry, I missed the that. The power to bind and loose, to declare halakha on scripture okay. and doctrine on faith and morals. Okay. So I guess a question that I've got, and then I, I don't know if this will be answered in the rest of the presentation, but it sounded like the the previous one where you were talking about the heavenly authority. Yeah. Uh, it sounded like you were saying that basically these thor the authority originates in in heaven and then it's sort of passed down to the yeah mm -hmm. the human individual. But then how yes. would the the ability to bind and loose like what what would the actual succession of that look like if the origination is in heaven the whole time? Is it just like a m metaphorical kind of? transition that happens or is it just like one person is able to hear like one person is getting kind of different divine knowledge like one per only one person is getting this knowledge at one at at each time what does a succession well, actually like look like yeah i mean so i think this will probably be addressed in the rest of the presentation but okay. um i can show you like how in judaism they viewed the transfer of power from moses onwards um yeah because that's where they base the power to bind and loose from from moses himself uh, so yeah, you camera, do you mind if I so go they, back to the presentation? So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's do that. But they would, so they would, um, just, just quick question. So they would, they would say that it goes back to Moses, but yes. then Moses would say it comes from heaven. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the power continues from there. Okay. That's how the succession goes. So the, yeah. so heaven, it, so once it's passed down to somebody like Moses or like Jesus, yeah. then it's no longer coming from heaven when it gets passed to the, to the next no, person. No, I mean, heaven heaven is heaven and earth are just as you know in the incarnation you have the the marriage so to speak of humanity uh, of of creation and the creator together right in judaism this idea is that the heavenly court and the earthly court are working together to protect the torah and preserve the people's knowledge of god and so there's definitely a very intimate relationship between heaven and earth in this view of judaism especially in the second temple period but the authority would it come would it still be coming from heaven when it when it comes to succession yeah it would still be coming from heaven but you it would be institutionally passed on to a successor on earth okay but the successor on earth is what are, what are they doing in the process they're just getting the divine knowledge right because it's been the originate the source is from heaven right they're just getting the knowledge of it um so they receive institutional authorization to be able to declare the halakha and especially to serve on the Sanhedrin and form a court and interpret the Torah. Um, but yeah, let me let me get to the presentation because that's where I explain in more detail what's going on here. Yeah. All right. Okay, so then the fifth parallel to mention is that both the successors of the apostles and the rabbis claim to rule the authority of their founder. So what I'm trying to show here is that if you're interpreting the power to bind and loose and what's going on so far in the original Jewish context of the New Testament, 
then what, for instance, the church fathers say in the Seventh Council of Carthage is not unfounded. So here's what they say. I think this is Cyprian of Carthage speaking. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ are plain, that he sent his apostles and gave to them alone the power that had been given to him by his father. And we have succeeded to them, governing the Lord's church with the same power. And then we see in the Babylonian Talmud by the rabbis in Rosh Hashanah 25a, uh, I think this is uh, one of the rabbis, uh, I thought it was Gamaliel, but he's cited anyway. If we call in question the decisions of Rabbi Gamaliel, we must call into question the decisions of every Beth Din or court which has existed since the days of Moses up to the present time. For it says, then went up Moses and Aaron, Nedab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Why were the names of the 70 of the elders not mentioned? To show that every group of three, which has acted as a Beth Din over Israel, is on a level with the Beth Din of Moses. And so the rabbis believed that when they made a ruling, they weren't making a ruling as a separate authority from Moses, but that the original authority of Moses was still ruling through them. Parallel number six is that both groups claim to be guided by the Holy Spirit. So in John 16, 13, Jesus says to the apostles when he sends them, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all to the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Now, the spirit goes back to the Old Testament. And remember, the rabbis claimed in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy and even Exodus that their rabbinic courts were founded in these passages. Here's what God says to Moses. The Lord therefore said to Moses, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their offices and officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take away some of the spirit who is upon you. Notice it's a who, it's a person, and put him upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you will not bear it by yourself. Now, we know in the literature of the Jerusalem or Palestinian Talmud that the rabbis claimed that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit guided them into truth to be able to come to correct halakhic decisions or gain secret knowledge. So this is in the second order of the uh, Talmud, Moed. And so in Sota chapter 9, Halakha 17, it talks about Rabbi Jacob Bar Edi, right, who in the name of Ra uh, Rebbe Joshua ben Levi. And so it happened that elders came together in the upper floor of the house, Gadia in Jericho, when a disembodied voice came and said to them, there are among you two who would be worthy that the Holy Spirit should rest on them. And one of them is Hillel the elder. They all looked at Samuel Minor. Again, it happened that the elders came together in a second floor of, at Jabne when a disembodied voice came and said to them, there are among you two who would be worthy that the Holy Spirit should rest on them. And one of them is Samuel Minor. They all looked at Rabbi Eliezer ben Hirakanos and were happy that their opinion coincided with that of the omnipresent. So the Holy Spirit showed them which of the rabbis had the correct decision and the Holy Spirit was resting upon them. Likewise, there's a story here about Rabbi Gamaliel, who the Holy Spirit comes to him and reveals to him the name of a certain uh, stranger. And it, you know, it mentions that Rabbi Gamaliel had it right by the Holy Spirit and he had never met this person before. And so the point I'm making here is that when Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit, this is a spirit that acted and guided the rabbis or the religious authorities to rule over Israel and help them make the proper decisions. And so when Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13, I think that's a close analog to understanding the Jewish context that he's talking about church leadership being guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the interesting point. Uh, this is point number seven to eight, the laying on of hands and succession records. So both the rabbis and the apostles use the laying on of hands to ordain men, and both the apostles and the rabbis used succession records in order to determine who could validly serve as an authority. Sir so Alfred Edersheim, in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he writes, quote, The judges of all these courts, the great Sanhedrin and Lord Tribunals, were equally set apart by ordination, semicha, originally that of the laying on of hands, 
ordination was conferred by three, of whom one at least must have been himself ordained and able to trace his ordination through Joshua to Moses. Moreover, as I mentioned down here, we know that the laying on of hands for ordination was practiced in the New Testament, and I provide citations, Acts 6, 3-6, 13, 2-3, and 1 Timothy 4-14. And likewise, uh, Bruce Metzger and Michael Coogan in their book, The Oxford Companion to the Bible, uh, back up this point. Now, what's interesting is that Michael Berger, in his book, Rabbinic Authority, published by Oxford University Press, notes, those without it, ordination tracing back to Moses, even if objectively quite erudite, are simply not authorized in the same way as the ordained scholar. So even if you were a very intelligent rabbi and you could teach in a synagogue, the problem is that if you did not have ordination going back to Joshua and Moses, if you didn't have that succession record on you, then you could not serve in the greater courts of Israel. You could not bind the conscience of all of Israel in the rulings of the great Sanhedrin. And so there's a clearly an institutional sense in which succession was passed on. Now, the power is fully passed uh, in principle for an indefinite amount of generations. And so here I cite from multiple dictionaries written by scholars of Judaism and rabbis and so on and so forth, where they explain, for instance, this is in the dictionary of Judaism in the biblical period. Um, through this deed, that is the laying on of hands or semicha, Jewish leaders were empowered to perform judicial functions. The concept of Semecha is based upon Moses laying of hands on Joshua, thereby transferring to Joshua a portion of the divine spirit that is rested on Moses. Rabbinic sources claim that Moses similarly ordained the elders, the 70, who in turn laid hands on their successors. Notice this sounds a lot like the New Testament and the apostles laying their hands on men. In this view, an unbroken chain of authority existed from Moses through early rabbinic times. In early Christianity, notice now we're going to Christianity, laying of hands similarly signify an extension of particular authority and blessing, and they have the scriptural citations there. In the Gospels, the gesture accompanies healing and blessing, uh, and so on and so forth, including exorcism. In the New Encyclopedia of Judaism, when they talk about Semecha, it says the ritual transmission of spiritual authority. It talks about how this was based upon Moses who passed it to Joshua. Um, and let's see here. And then we know from the writings of the Jewish people very early on in the Mishnah Avot 1-1 or the Avot of Rabbi Natan that it records how the Sanhedrin of the time of Christ had the authority to bind and loose passed on through Joshua to the men of the great assembly or the Sanhedrin. And so it notice it note in the last sen the sentence that says the recipient received the title of rabbi and was endowed with full judicial authority. And then I also have the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion showing basically the same thing once again. So to quote from the Mishnah Avot 1.1, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and handed it down to Joshua. And Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets handed it to the men of the great assembly. The great assembly is the Sanhedrin. Okay. And then I want to emphasize once again that, for instance, when Jesus says in Matthew 23, 2 to 3, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat in Greek, that is Moses' cathedras. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. In D.A. Carson's Expositor Bible Commentary, uh, the new edition in page 531, he writes, quote, These leaders sit in Moses' seat. To sit on X's seat often means to succeed X. Exodus 11, 5, 12, 29, 1 Kings 1, 35, and you see the rest of the citations including from Josephus himself, who was in the first century. This would imply that the leaders of the law are Moses' legal successors, possessing all his authority, a view the scribes themselves held, and he cites from the rabbinic sources once again. And so Moses existed before Jesus about 1,400 years, uh, given some conservative estimates. So for 1,400 years, the power to bind and loose was passed through the laying on of hands. If Christ established a new rabbinic court in the New Testament, then why wouldn't it pass indefinitely forward? Once again, when we look at the witness of the early church, here's what we see. We see first Clement, uh, written by Clement of Rome, the fourth bishop of Rome, writing around 68 to 69 AD, before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. He writes, quote, So too our apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that, 
that strife would arise over the office of bishop. For this reason, since they understood perfectly in advance what would happen, they appointed those we have already mentioned, and afterwards they added a codicil to the effect that if these men should die, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. Okay, there's a lot of important things going on in Clement. The first thing to point out is that this letter is, nobody disputes that this letter was written in the first century, and uh, recent scholarship has now favored the earlier dating, that is to say the dating before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. If this is the case, then this could either, this could predate some of our very gospels. That's how early this letter is. And if you're skeptical of my point, read Michael Lacona's book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. Read his section on Clement of Rome. Michael Lacona, a Protestant New Testament scholar, defends the early dating of Clement, or at least he believes that it's uh, probable. But he also defends that Clement of Rome personally knew the apostles, Peter, and possibly Paul. Because Paul mentions in Philippians 4.13 that he is sending some emissaries to the Philippian church, and he, or the church in Philippi, and he says, and so too am I sending Clement, whose name is in the book of life. Lacona notes in his book that the early church was unanimous, not only that Clement of Rome is the author of 1 Clement, but that Clement is the one mentioned in, first, uh, excuse me, in Philippians 4.13. So you have someone an incredibly early eyewitness to the apostles telling us something about what Jesus taught, that strife would arise over the office of bishop, and that Jesus warned them, okay, protect this office. And so then the apostles added a codicil or a provision or a rule. So if you're going to be charitable and ask yourself, where do the church fathers get this idea of apostolic succession in the bishopric or in the presbyterate? Look at First Clement. It's there in the first century already. And then even Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies, book four, chapter 26, uh, he's writing in 180 AD, but this is still within living memory of the apostles because remember Irenaeus' teacher is Polycarp and Polycarp was a direct student of John. Here's what Irenaeus writes. Therefore, it is necessary to obey the elders who are in the church, those who, as I have shown, possess the succession from the apostles. They, together with the succession of the episcopate, have received the certain gift of truth. J. N. D. Kelly, in his book, Early Christian Doctrines, Kelly is not a Catholic, he's an Anglican, uh, Roman Catholic. He explains that the certain gift of truth, Irenaeus means infallibility, according to the good pleasure of the Father. And it is necessary to hold in suspicion others who depart from the primitive succession, and assemble themselves together in any place whatsoever. Consider them either as heretics of perverse minds, or as schismatics, hereticons, puffed up and self-pleasing, or again as hypocrites, acting this way for the sake of money and pride, for all these have fallen from the truth. What's the point of mentioning these church fathers? The point is this. If you're going to steal man, the church fathers, or be charitable to them, and understand where did the church get the idea that we had apostolic succession, that we could bind and loose, that we could issue anathemas. When you look at the early first century context of the New Testament, it's hard to miss it. And I also want to make this point. Some people will object, but I only accept sola scriptura. That is to say that you only believe that scripture is infallible. Well, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says to obey the traditions, whether handed down by word of mouth or by letter. We have an apostolic tradition here. Clement of Rome is probably the best early evidence that we have of an extra biblical apostolic tradition. Some people will object, well, no, the apostles wrote down all of their traditions in the New Testament. If you believe that, then how in the world can I falsify that belief? Because here I'm presenting you a source from the first century that knew the apostles and was trusted by them that shows you a clear counterexample to the claim that the scripture contains all of the apostolic traditions. We have here an apostolic tradition that originally appears to have been passed by word of mouth and then is later written down by Clement himself. So I'm saying even if you take Sola Scriptura seriously, you cannot dismiss what first Clement is saying here. His testimony is so early that it is almost impossible, I'd say, to say that it is inauthentic. Now, the other thing I want to mention now is the point on tradition. 
So there are written and unwritten traditions in both Judaism and in early Christianity. So in early Judaism, they had this idea of the oral and the written Torah. That is to say they have written traditions and oral traditions. The written tradition eventually becomes the Pentateuch or the books of Moses. The rabbis of the second temple period, that is to say the period during the New Testament, believe that God delivered two Torahs to Moses on Mount Sinai. The written Torah is part of, but not the entire story. The oral Torah, passed on by oral tradition and preserved by rabbinic authority, contains the proper interpretation of the written word. And it includes other things like uh, feast days for the Jewish people and holidays and so on and so forth. Remember I mentioned 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where written and unwritten traditions are mentioned. And I have other scriptural citations there where Paul mentions the things that he's handed down. Craig Keener points out in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians 2.15 on the IVP New Testament background commentary, quote, Pharisaic Judaism emphasized the careful passing on of traditions from earlier teachers. Paul passed on to the Thessalonians believers the teachings of Jesus, many of which he has alluded to in this chapter. Notice that Paul, even though he is now part of Christianity, he's still using some of the things that he learned as a Pharisee in order to preserve the churches, to teach them how to organize themselves and how to pass on traditions. Likewise, when Keener speaks of Galatians 1.13 uh, to 14, where Paul talks about his piety as a Pharisee, he notes, quote, traditions could refer to general community customs, but given Paul's Pharisaism, Philippians 3.5, it probably refers to Pharisaic traditions on which Jews discussing Pharisaism co generally commented. Pharisees were known for their adherence to oral tradition. Paul thus understands the Jewish Palestinian piety of his day far better than his opponents do. And so what I'm arguing here is that there's a clear parallel between the rabbis and the apostles, especially Paul, in the passing on of oral and unwritten traditions. Number 10. The office of presbyter or elder also existed in the Jewish courts and the church itself. So the word presbyteron refers to a council of elders, whether the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem, Luke 22, 66, Acts 22, 5, or a council of Christian leaders. 1 Timothy 4, 14, uh, Ignatius' uh, epistles to the Ephesians 2, 2 and 4, 1, Magnesians 2, 1, 13, 1, Trillians 2, 2, 7, 2, Philadelphians 4, 1. Uh, the letters of Ignatius were written at the end of the first century and into the early second century. Ignatius is a direct student of the Apostle John, and he refers to the Christian leaders as the presbyters or the elders. The same word is used to refer to the elders in the Sanhedrin. Here's the point that I also wanted to mention at the beginning, um, but I had to build up to here. Jewish tradition contains the belief that the Messiah would reestablish, not destroy, not do away with the Sanhedrin. Here's what uh, Rabbi Arya Kaplan in his book, The Handbook of Jewish Thought, says, quote, The Messiah, he, will reestablish the Sanhedrin, the religious supreme court and legislature of the Jewish people. This is a necessary precondition for the rebuilding of the third temple. And what is the third temple? We know in the New Testament, the third temple, the new temple of God is the church, as it is written. I will restore your judges as at first. Notice that God is saying to the Jewish people, he will restore their judges and your counselors as in the beginning. When was the beginning of the Jewish courts? In the days of Moses. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and those who return to her with righteousness. Notice in the New Testament, we are called that righteous, faithful city. Isaiah 1, 26 to 27. This is a prophecy that God gave to the Jewish people, that the courts and the judges would be restored. Such a Sanhedrin would be able to formally recognize the Messiah as King of Israel. The other day I was reading through a book titled Matthew's, uh, excuse me, titled A Vision for the Church, Studies in Early Christian Ecclesiology, uh, edited by Michael Thompson and Marcus Bachmuel. And in the chapter, Matthew's Vision for the Church, here's what Michael Goulder writes, and I don't think Goulder is a Catholic at all. He says, quote, there was, however, a second and greater source of divine law since Jesus came, and he had not only laid down many prescriptions for the church himself, but he had also set up a kind of Christian Sanhedrin, the apostolic college, to interpret his rulings. Jesus had called Simon Kephas the rock, 
And Matthew took this to mean that he was like a foundation stone to the church as a building, to which in another metaphor, he held the keys. And he talks about how Matthew is a marvelous teacher and that he uses brilliant images. And then he says, binding and loosing were regular Jewish terms for the authority of the sages to enforce rules or make exceptions. And he cites the Jewish sources once again. And Peter is being given this exact same authority in the church. Any enforcements or exceptions he makes, Jesus will ratify. Exactly the same words are used in the plural to the 12 at 1818. So Matthew sees the apostolic college as a Christian equivalent to the Sanhedrin. What was the Jewish prophecy that Jesus would restore the courts of Israel, that the Messiah as the new Moses would do what Moses had done, establish a court that could interpret the Torah, that could interpret his teaching, interpret the divine law. And we see in Luke 10, 1, Jesus, like Moses, appoints 70 disciples to assist him in his mission. But it gets even better. We know that the early Christians identified themselves as God's Sanhedrin. This is Ignatius of Antioch, remember, the direct student of the Apostle John. He writes, quote, in his epistle to the Trillians, In like manner, let all, reverence to the de uh, let all reverence the deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ, and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Father, and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God and the assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. The direct disciple of the Apostle John is saying, that, that the presbyters are the new Sanhedrin of God. This is written in the first century. This is the final point that I'll make, which is that Jewish authority revolved around a cathedra or a chair or a seat with universal authority, as does a certain Christian tradition, Catholicism. And so this will be a way of setting up an argument for the papacy. So remember, uh, in Matthew 23, 2-3, Jesus mentions the seat of Moses. Michael Berger, in his book, Rabbinic Authority, he mentions the fact that the Sanhedrin, who sat on the seat of Moses, exercised an ex-cathedra ex authority because it's from the cathedra or the chair of Moses. So Berger writes, in this chapter, we will examine the claim that the sage's authority is, in fact, that of the Sanhedrin. This is a form of ex-cathedra authority. The office is authoritative for various reasons, and these persons, the Talmudic sages, occupy that office. He also cites on page 58, in this sense, I am discussing now Semica, remember ordination, is really a classic case of ex cathedra authority, where we deem someone to be sitting in a seat of authority. The contemporary or ordained, ordinance, excuse me, sits in his teacher's seat, but as a logical regression, the question ultimately takes us back to Moses. This forces us to address how the Jewish tradition understands the nature of Moses' authority. And then finally, uh, Herbert Bastor and Marcia Cohen in their book, The Gospel of Matthew and Judea Traditions, they also explain that they believe the seat of Moses is the high court of Jerusalem or the Sanhedrin. And then they write to our mind, or to my mind, this is the high court in Jerusalem, which issued binding decrees ex cathedra, speaking anachronistically. Now, it's anachronistic because the Jews did not have, um, they did not believe in ex cathedra in the same sense that, um, you know, that, that Catholics use it today. But there's a, a sufficient similarity where it's a final, definitive, universal ruling from the chair of someone. All right. And that's in that sense, then the analogy, uh, analogy can be made. So the argument that I'd make then is that Peter, like Joshua, is seated upon the seat of Moses. Now, I am not basing my argument here on the work of a Catholic New Testament scholar. I'm basing my work on a Protestant Lutheran New Testament scholar who admits that Christ commissioned Peter to be head shepherd over Israel as his successor in John 21, 15 to 19. Let me repeat, this is not a Catholic source. This is a Protestant New Testament scholar who recognizes this point. Now we can talk about why he's still Protestant, but he's acknowledging this much, which goes to show that at least when later popes and later church fathers, you know, use John 21, 15 to 19 as a proof text of the papacy of the supremacy of Peter, they're not wrong. So for instance, Roger David Oss mentions the fact that we know in early first century Palestinian Jewish writings, Joshua is seated upon the cathedra or seat or chair of Moses. So he writes, quote, Moses is raising Joshua into the seat before him in the pre-70 CE Palestinian writing Testament of Moses, 
with the now cathedra for seat and his seating causing Joshua to sit upon his chair, armchair, in the Tanatic Midrash Sifra on Numbers 2719, as well as later, um, you know, interpret uh, later documents, all go back to the Agadic interpretation of Numbers 2719. The point of that document is simply saying that it was standard Jewish interpretation, at least during the time of Jesus and leading up to it, that Joshua was seated upon the seat of Moses. And we know that the New Testament authors and Jesus himself knew about the seat of Moses because Jesus mentions it in Matthew 23, 2 to 3. Okay, so uh, Oss goes into further detail in his book on ways in which Peter and Joshua parallel each other, especially like the text in John 21, 15 to 19. There are certain things that appear there that if you know the Jewish traditions, you would know that John is borrowing heavily from them. For instance, when, Pete, when Jesus mentions the three sheep that he's handing to Peter, if you look in Jewish tradition, it says exactly the same thing, that Moses handed those same three sheep to Joshua when he was appointing him as his successor over Israel. Now, one thing I want to focus on is the confirmation of the fact that Peter is seated on the seat of Moses. I think this occurs in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, I think we see a good parallel with Joshua 7:25. So both Peter and Joshua, once they become the leaders of Israel, they both judge cases where someone had hoarded property they should not have possessed. They are both ending with the death of the perpetrators by divine sanction. And here I have a quote from the Protestant New Testament scholar Ben Witherington III on page 217 of his commentary on the Acts of the Apostles, where he also cites that, yeah, these are parallel cases to each other. So he's citing a scholar named Derrick, and he says here, quote, when a man had been struck down by the hand of heaven, as Joshua specifically says was the case with Akan in Joshua 7.25, his corpse must surely be consigned rapidly and silently to the grave. Uh, no one should mourn him. The suicide, the rebel against society, the excommunicate, the apostate, the criminal condemned to death by the Jewish court would be buried in haste and without, ceremonial and, uh, without ceremony, and no one might indeed observe the usual lengthy and troublesome rituals of mourning for him. Notice that when Ananias and Sapphira are rebuked by Peter, which people, which scholars acknowledge is his use of his binding and loosing authority, this is stated by F.F. F. Bruce and others in Hard Sayings of the Bible, their entry on binding and loosing. They mention the fact that Peter uses his disciplinary function as a rabbi now to condemn Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, so he condemns them, and they both fall dead. And Joshua says that. And just as he, you know, as Akan had fallen dead, it was because of the hand of heaven or the hand of God. So in both cases, Peter and Joshua judge a similar case. In both cases, the rebuke comes with death. And in both cases, the death is caused in some way by God himself. And I mean, the parallels are just incredible. And then moreover, the Jewish people believe that the Sanhedrin or the seat of Moses was established in Deuteronomy 17 to 13. And notice what it says in Deuteronomy 17 to 13. Then what this is so this occurs after Moses is talking about if the rabbi issues his ruling, the priest or the judge, and you disobey his ruling, you have to be put to death. That's what Moses says when he's establishing his court. And then notice he says, then all the people will hear and be afraid and will not act insolently again. So in the Greek, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament around the time of Jesus, it says, will hear and be afraid. So notice the Greek words that are used there. It's a formula. Or if you disobey and you die, you know, the people will hear and be afraid. In Acts 5.5, 5, when Peter rebukes Ananias and Sapphira, the people heard and great fear came over all those who heard about it. In Acts chapter 5.11, uh, it switched to where great fear came over the whole church and all the people who heard about these things. So notice once again, disobedience of God's representative leads to death. The people hear and are afraid. And only Acts 5.11 kind of switches the order from hearing to being afraid, to fearing to hearing. And so what I'm saying here, oh, and I should have included this quote, but do I have it? No, I don't. Well, Roger David Oss talks about in his book how Palestinian, wait, is it here? No, I don't, I should, I should have had it. Uh, it talks. He talks about how um, Palestinian and early Hellenistic Jews would have viewed Peter then as seating, sitting on the seat of Moses, just as Joshua had received the seat of Moses and in effect, then, the entire power of the Sanhedrin would be concentrated into one man. And this is where we get the idea, at least, of an ex-cathedra pope. 
So when you when you turn off your screen, it like automatically went to my face, and I was just like sitting here looking bored. <laughs> Hopefully, that no, didn't uh, throw people off. So yeah, no, I was uh, I I was glad to to get through all of it, and I was thinking about the value of uh, what we just did just now. I mean, we're already over time, so I don't think we're gonna have a whole lot of time to discuss what you just presented. But I but nevertheless, I still think there's a whole lot of value in what was presented, uh, partly because when I started to investigate Catholicism, I didn't think that you could make a really good, strong, robust case for the truth of it. And so I think that this today is actually going to just be a nice counterexample to that to show people that, hey, you've got to do more work. You've got to research it. You've got to look into it deeply. And that's not to say that Catholicism is necessarily therefore true, just to say that there's a whole lot more uh, to it. And I would encourage everybody to to look deeper into it just because it's it's important to seek truth and beauty and goodness like we talked about earlier. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think there's a whole lot of value in, in that. So thanks. Thanks for putting all that together is beautiful. And so let's, uh, let's get down to, uh, just some, some things, some sticking points for me. Uh, the silver bullet thing at the very beginning, I would like to talk about that, uh, just a couple minutes. So silver bullets, I, I, I still don't like them. I think it's better to talk in terms of, uh, evidential like pieces. I don't, I don't know the best analogy. I know you yeah. like analogies. I don't know the best analogy to use. Uh, in this case, but you know, you've got this weight, this may weigh in favor of Protestantism. This one may weigh in favor of Catholicism. And then you just got to weigh everything together and see where the balance of the evidence weighs that I think to to me, that's like the best way to do it. So even if you've got what you think is a really good argument for the magisterium, I think you still got to weigh that against, you know, some kind of argument that you could make for annihilationism from scripture, or uh, you've got all of these other, I mean, because what you could do, here's something uh, to consider Swan is that it's very easy to put all of these into deductive arguments. So you could say if Catholicism is true, then annihilation is false. Second premise, annihilation, annihilationism is true. Therefore, conclusion, Catholicism is false. So in that case, because it's a deduct- deductive argument, you've got to be able to deny one of the premises and you don't really want to deny the first one because the Catholic teaches, uh, the Catholic church teaches that annihilationism is false or that tr- the traditional view is true. So you'd have to deny the second premise but then you're just going to have to get your your hands dirty and, and get into all of the, the literature on annihilationism versus traditionalism versus universalism. So I think yeah. that, uh, that, that that's, I suppose, the main reason why I don't like the silver bullet terminology. I think that ultimately is still going to come down to assessing the evidence mm-hmm. overall and, and looking at the big picture. Right. But if we if we look at the claim that the San, that the, this magisterium is based upon the messianic identity of Christ which is something that you and I both agree and accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And we Mm -hmm. both agree that we have to interpret historical documents within their proper context. Um, And we look at the early Jewish context of the church. I mean, we're talking sources from the first century, like Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch. And we see what they're saying. It aligns perfectly with the idea of a a new Sanhedrin or magisterium. And so the point that I'd make here is that if you want to say that on one hand, you know, so for instance, let's say that you try, you, you, this is part of our evidential, uh, you know, look at the dialectic, right? This is a piece of evidence that goes into the whole picture. Um, the problem is that if you try to say, okay, but I believe in annihilationism, but I believe Christ established a magisterium. And then you know that that magisterium has already spoken, right, about the issue of hell and so on and so forth. Then you have to find a way to reconcile the two um, some way, somehow. And so what I'm saying is that the magisterium received divine authorization from Christ to interpret the scriptures, to sift through the traditions and determine which of them are valid and which of them are not. Um, and that's the, that's the point that I'm making there. If the yeah. magisterium is true, then you're not at liberty to disagree with it. I don't think, though, that you could argue that the magisterium is entailed by what you've said. So there, there always is going to be like some wiggle room. So you could have come up with some alternative interpretation. I mean, you mentioned the one right. from... Stephen Nemesh, even though you don't think that that is like a good, you know, a good alternate interpretation or it's like it's, it's a good position, uh, you disagree with it, but it, it is nevertheless an option. So you could say uh, option in the sense that it's just like broadly logically possible. So, right. And, uh, uh, you know, sorry, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, one point that I do want to make, right, is that just because it's possible, I don't, I don't place much value or weight upon that, right? If you want to say it's equally plausible, then that's another question to consider. But for instance, um, if you look at the New Testament, if someone leaves the New Testament thinking that Christ was only spiritually resurrected, but not physically resurrected, 
that is such an implausible interpretation that even though it's it's possible that someone could leave the text somehow, I don't know, like uh, maybe they only focus upon the episode with Paul and Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, I would say that it's such an implausible interpretation that it's not faithful to the original intent of the authors and the original witness of the early Christian community. And so it's it's like possible to the point of being negligible. Yeah, so my point was not that it's possible, therefore it's true or anything like that. The, the point was that when we're thinking about silver bullets and the magisterium, what you, would ha what you would have to argue is that there is no wiggle room. There are no other possibilities. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be entailed. It's got to be something that sort of necessarily falls out of it because otherwise what we're going to do is we're going to just be weighing evidential chips and see which one, you know, where, where the, the total evidence weighs. And so that would yeah. be, that. that's my ultimate point here is that there are no silver bullets that's uh, that's not a thing in probability. It's just this evidence weighs in this direction, this evidence weighs in this direction, and we've got to weigh it all together and, and see where the evidence ultimately mm -hmm. goes. So, so as long as there's as long as there there is an alternate possibility of some other kind of interpretation, then that would itself be evidence in favor of the alternate interpretation because we've got this uh, evidence that conflicts with this interpretation that that you prefer. You've got uh, some evidence against that interpretation because it, it comes in conflict with this other evidence. And so the other uh, possibilities are, are therefore going to, to uh, increase just by yeah. by sort of default, by probabilistic. That's so, just... Cameron, would you reject the resurrection of Jesus being a silver bullet for Christianity? Yeah, I would. Okay. Yeah, because I just don't like that terminology in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a whole lot okay. of really good evidence for uh, for the, the the resurrection of Jesus and and all that, yeah. but <clears throat> I wouldn't say that you know uh, infallib or the uh, inerrancy. I, I wouldn't say that inerrancy necessarily falls out of like Jesus rising from the dead or anything like that. I think that you could build sure. arguments mm -hmm. for Jesus being a Jew and and having you know a really high view of the Old Testament and then also establishing some kind of like church. And so I mm -hmm. think that you could build a case, but I don't think you've got like a silver bullet. So I would disagree. Uh, maybe Mike and uh, Mike Lacona and I actually don't disagree. It's just like a, 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 a you know a nice little word that can be used to kind of get an idea sure. across. Mm. But I think ultimately he would say that it probably comes down to the evidence and you just got to weigh everything up eventually. So you can't just say that like once mm. you've got this one thing, it just you don't have to look at any of the other evidence or you, you can just ignore it. How about Cameron? I just say one last thing and maybe you say a last word and then we can wrap up this episode. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, because I know we've been going for a while, and I have to I have to teach a class, and so. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. No, you're good. Um, you got to teach yeah, a class, so, and you're not feeling well, and you just yeah. did a two hour stream with me. Yeah, I mean, like you know, I'm not a lightweight, you're a beast. so I just I keep on going. You know, <laughs> got to do the Lord's work. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. Well, once again, Cameron, thank you for having me on. I'm sorry that I just like dumped all this evidence on you and everything, but uh. I hope it was of help in some way or some capacity, right? It gives you something to think about and even your audience too. And the point that I want to make is that, you know, if you're looking back at early Christian history and you want to know where did the church get the idea, where did the Christians get the idea of a bishop, where did they get the idea of a council, of issuing anathemas, of excommunicating heretics, when you look back into the New Testament and the early context of Christianity in its Jewish roots, what you find, I think, is exactly what you would expect in the evidence, whereas the Protestant ecclesiology doesn't seem to line up well with the evidence at all. And some Protestants I've known have made the objection, well, OK, so when I accept that Christ established this magisterium, but it only lasted one generation with the apostles and it died with them. The problem is that when you look at the background context of what's going on in the New Testament, the power to bind and loose was passed to successors with full power. And we know that the practices of apostolic succession can be traced back to the first century in the teaching of Clement of Rome, who personally knew the apostles in the first century, um, and even the Jewish practices of the courts of their day. And so my question to you is, if this isn't enough, a document from the first century, from someone who knew the apostles, if this isn't enough, then what will be enough? Um, when we look at the early history of the church, when we try to steal man and be charitable towards the church fathers, I think what we find is exactly what we would expect if at least the Roman Catholic or Orthodox ecclesiology were true. Christ as the Redeemer of Israel and the entire world. Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the prophet like Moses. He created a new Sanhedrin and a new magisterium. And I want to ask you the question, if you lived in the Old Testament, let's say, 
and you were living under Moses and Moses demanded that you obey the courts that were interpreting the Torah, would the arguments that you're using against a New Testament court also be used against Moses in the Old Testament? Because we know for a fact that Moses established the courts of Israel and you were not at liberty to disagree with the courts when they interpret the Torah. If your argument could defeat that, then it could also defeat the Old Testament and Moses as well. And so I'm saying is use a consistent standard. And I think what we'll find is that when we look closer at the identity of Christ and the early Christians, the witness is simply overwhelming that they intended to establish a new rabbinic authority that can interpret scripture and discipline the community. We were not meant to interpret the Bible by ourselves on our own. We were meant to, as Christians, to have a home in the church with a living tradition going back to the apostles that can show us the truth and the way. And I know that, um, you know, there are those who will disagree with me. Maybe there are some who will find this convincing or not. And I just want to say that at the end of the day, I do believe, you know, that um, that Christ is the Messiah, that Christ um, is inviting us to become part of the Catholic Church, to be part of the magisterium that he built. And so it's my hope today that at least the evidence I presented shows us how we love Christ. Because in John 14, 15, Christ says, if you love me, then you'll do as I command. Who are we to disagree with the Messiah? All right. Thanks for that closing. And I just wanted to reiterate that I think that this is super valuable. I think that uh, the presentation that you gave is really, really well researched, so much detail and information. So I'll, I'll just share some, some sort of overall thoughts on the presentation and kind of close it out. So yeah, I've already talked about the silver bullet thing. I uh, don't really have a whole lot of problems about Moses being founding father and then uh, Jesus being a sort of new Moses. I think that theme is pretty obvious in Matthew and uh, kind of throughout the New Testament. The whole concept of binding and loosing, I thought that was really, really uh, fascinating. I really appreciate you del delving so deep into that. And <clears throat> what I guess what I would say there is that uh, you said something that was super interesting about the way that the authority is sort of transferred and that, that it actually comes from heaven. And I think that that's ultimately going to be sort of a pebble in your shoe or like a something that's going to maybe work against you ultimately in that what you have is you've got so I, I was thinking of a, of an example of my my daughter my son my daughter's six my son just turned four and sometimes what i'll do is if uh my son say is playing upstairs and my daughter is downstairs i'll say hey cammy come in here hey go tell hendrix that we've got to you know eat lunch right now or something so what i'm doing is i'm passing down my authority i'm giving it to my daughter to then use that authority to tell my son hey it's time to come and, and eat lunch she doesn't have that authority on her own she can't just like go around and boss him around we don't allow that right any any good parent doesn't let their kids boss each other around so the authority comes from me she has the authority only in the sense that she gets it from me and i think that uh, that's kind of what you said about the uh the successors is that they get the uh, their authority from heaven and the way that they get the way that they know what's authoritative is they get some kind of divine revelation you even shared a passage about that in scripture so i think ultimately uh that's going to work against you because what, who's to say that there couldn't be you know multiple different people who could get the same sort of experience some kind of divine revelation about something from heaven it doesn't seem like there's uh too much wrong there and it, there's there's another issue is that um it could like just because my daughter say has the authority my authority and that i've passed it on to her it doesn't therefore follow that she's carrying around that authority infallibly or that she's she never gets it wrong she didn't mishear something that i told her so I think that um, ultimately that's going to be kind of a thorn in your side. Is that the right analogy to use metaphor? Um, but that was just some, you know, initial thoughts. I'm sure that we could go a whole lot deeper into that if we had more time. I'm sure you want to do part three maybe or something like that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what we can do. Um, yeah, I think that ultimately that's that might be where I would start the conversation in response to uh, to what you presented. I, no, one, one more thought that I had was uh, this all seemed consistent with Protestantism. And it also seemed consistent with Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, and when I say Protestantism, I, I mean very specific versions of Protestantism, maybe right, like if they Anglicanism. Apostolic succession. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. Anglicanism or yeah. Mm -hmm. So it didn't it didn't seem like this was uh, necessarily a strong argument for Catholicism proper, more like something you know Apostolic succession, maybe an argument for that for for a, some kind of magisterium. Um, but even then, like I I I don't know. I mean, because I. I as a Protestant, I, I want to say that there is authority in, in pastors, and even though there's not like a direct line of passing it down, there is still authority that's passed on by Christ. So 
and that can happen like doesn't have to be some kind of like temporal succession between human beings and some kind of like ceremony i don't know so th th but th th again that would just be the start of a conversation this is i know you've got a thousand things to say in response to what i just said <laughs> but you can't say anything because this is my closing and i'll let you talk yeah hey, but uh, Cameron, Swan... i just want to say god oh sorry i just want to say god bless you cameron and um i really love you brother yeah i love you too man and hopefully uh hopefully you feel better soon you've uh had this cold how many days has it been just a few a week about i think oh mm -hmm. a week so you had it when we when we had our last one yeah it was like springing up a little bit during mm. that time but i managed yeah all right well let's go ahead and go i know you've got to get out of here so uh thank everybody for watching and we'll see you in the next video so peace out hey it's me again uh actually don't leave yet i've got something super super important to tell you so first of all you're awesome like you you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?